Here with his 2018 stock market outlook is Ken Fisher, chairman of Fisher Investments. Ken, welcome back. Good to see you. Always great to be with you, Scott. All right, so what do you make of the record rally in stocks this year? It's been incredible to watch. Well, I don't really think of it as a record rally. Let me just be real clear. This year in the U.S. stock market is the average annual return of a bull market hmm. in history. It's not an above average year. People forget that. Normally, bull markets have a pattern that's more or less. It's not perfect, but most of the advance is the first third and the back third, and the middle is flatter. That's the normal pattern. They accelerate off the bottom in a V-shape, and then they flatten out in the middle, and then they accelerate again in the end. But the average of that in history is a 22% return, mm. which people forget that bull markets are twice the average long-term annual return that includes bear markets. Mm. This year is not so extraordinary. It's just having gone through that flat period or the flatter middle, we're not used to this kind of a number because the, in this long bull market, that middle flat period was pretty low. I think we're just in that acceleration phase, but we're also in the period where foreign's taken over from the U.S., which happened all this year and should continue for another year or so and maybe, maybe too far in the future for the rest of this bull market. But if I had to make a guess, I'd say this year is as, this year 2018 is as stronger, stronger than 2017, but most of it should be overseas, not mm. America. This should be a foreign-led bull market from here. So that's how you should position your portfolio going into 2018? Overweight to foreign over U.S. So if you look at the world, the world is a little over 50% U.S. in terms of cap weighting XEM. And you really want to flip that around and have it more non-U.S. than U.S. with your U.S. weighting still material but well under 50 percent. But still, everyone wants to know when the U.S. bull market will end. Is there any Well, the U.S. bull market will end the same time that the non-U.S. bull market ends because they're always positively correlated. Mm -hmm. You will never find the rest of your life any material time where the U.S. market goes one way and the non-U.S. market goes the other way. Mm -hmm. They're always positively correlated. The question is which leads and which lags. Mm -hmm. I got a view, might be wrong, but it's taken us eight years to get to 2017 mm -hmm. and from 2009. Generally, we're just in that part that's starting to ramp up. This bull market could easily go on, I'm not saying it will, could easily go on another four years. Hmm. And what kind of returns? But, but when you get to the yeah. end and people are in John Templeton's euphoria phase, bull markets are born mm -hmm. on pessimism, grow on skepticism, mature on optimism, and die of euphoria. When you get to the euphoria phase, people won't be worrying so much about when it's going to end. Mm. But we're not at euphoria yet. No, we're in the optimism phase. Mm. We're not to euphoria. Uh, one of the things uh, that I was talking to Jim about earlier is that Bitcoin is like the window pane into a room of euphoria will be coming too soon, where you can first see the animal spirits coming alive in this bull market. We really haven't had animal spirits in this bull market at all, a phrase John Maynard Keynes made up a long time ago, that animal spirits thing coming alive a little bit like late at night at the party, uh, that's just getting going in this as a cameo example looking into it, but it says people are ready to have euphoria. Mm -hmm. We're still in the optimism phase. Uh, you know, bull markets die of euphoria because bear markets start on euphoria. Bear markets kind of are born on euphoria. They drift on grinding economics, they accelerate on recession, and they die on panic. Mm -hmm. uh, I think if John Templin had ever been asked about that, that's, what he, that's the line he would have used. Mm -hmm. But they're born on euphoria. And that euphoria means you don't worry about the things you worried about in earlier years, you forget about them. New highs, being scary, people forget about it in euphoria. The market's P.E. is too high, people forget about it in euphoria. When's it all going to end? It's not going to end, I can see forever. <laughs> All right, you brought up Bitcoin, not me. So I have to ask you, though, what do you say to those people who are in Bitcoin right now? I say I don't know anything about Bitcoin. Mm. Uh, I don't know a bit about it. It's uh, not a coin. It's uh, a thing. And if you really believe you know what's going to happen with Bitcoin, you don't need any advice from me at all about anything. And if you think you do and you're wrong, you're not going to take any advice from me no matter what anyway. So what difference does it make what I would have? Because I don't really know how to value Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Risk to the market. And, and I don't have to yeah. do Bitcoin to succeed in life. Right. No. Nobody has to do anything to succeed in life, really, mm -hmm. if you talk about any single thing. Bitcoin, as you know, is something that's a lot like 
one big stock. The fact of the matter is there is no one big stock anybody has to own. Let's talk about risks to the market in 2018 and beyond. What do you see on the horizon geopolitical-wise, political-wise? I mean, how should people factor in the possibility of some sort of big correction? Well, a big correction, normally defined as a drop bigger than 10 percent but less than 20 percent mm -hmm. in the broad market, can come at any time for any reason or no reason. You don't need a causal factor. You just need a wild story. Mm -hmm. And that could happen at any point in time, and I don't think people should try to time corrections because they come and go pretty darn fast. I mean, three, four months and they're over with, so if you miss them within a bull market, you're fine. What you're really talking about is a bear market. And the thing that would knock us asunder from Templeton's euphoria world would be something like unintended consequences of massive proportions in something like MIFID II, where the regulatory feature stops fundamental global trade. If you take, for example, uh, our 75 plus trillion dollar global GDP, you need a couple of trillion dollars of big bad new that hasn't been pre-priced to turn an otherwise global expansion into a recession. That reality of a couple of trillion dollars of big bad new that hasn't been pre-priced, that, that's a, it happens sometimes, but it's a tall order. And in that tall order, uh, you've got this potential problem where it's got to stop trade. So, for example, people always fear things like wars. You get a world war, you're going to have that dilemma you're talking about. If you have a regional conflict, you never do because global trade goes on around it. Mm. I mean, the his we have a lot, a lot, a lot of regional wars in history. Mm. And we've got a lot of stock market history. You can pair them up and see what happened before, during, and after the regional war? And the answer is markets treat them like, at most, a little minor speed bump. They don't even think about them. They just blow right on through them because global trade continues around them, on the water, in I'm, the air. I'm glad you brought up MIFID, too, because that goes into effect in 2018. How does that affect your outlook on European banks, especially if you're someone, like you said, who likes overseas stocks? So let me be real clear on this. It's the unintended consequence that would get you, not the intended consequence. Mm -hmm. The intended consequence is what's been priced in. Mm -hmm. Intended consequence is what we all know about, talk about, debate, and therefore is pre-priced into the market. Mm -hmm. It's the part where it doesn't end up working the way people thought it would work. So let me give you an example from the last cycle. FAS 157 and ISB 157, the mark-to-market accounting rules, mm -hmm. wiped two trillion bucks off of bank balance sheets. Mm -hmm was a huge negative that nobody really saw coming at them. I didn't see it at the time. People just didn't see this unintended consequence. It started in November of 2007 and was eliminated by the SEC, uh, I can't remember, three weeks before or three weeks after the bottom in 2009. And the whole time it's causing bank write-downs, but bank write-downs. In the, in the middle of 2008, I tried to figure out why were the banks forced to take all these write-downs with no actual market transactions? And it was FAS 157 that was doing it. By the time I figured it out, I concluded it was too late to try to sidestep it. But be that as it may, my point being, a couple of trillion bucks of unintended consequences because a reg doesn't work the way people think it'll work, mm. that could be catastrophic. I want to shift and talk about your retirement advice. People are walking into their... My best advice is don't do it. <laughs> well, but when it comes to financial advisors, what questions should people be asking in 2018? So I think the most important feature singularly for most people is trying to figure out if the advisor is capable of getting them to take care of their long-term primary purposes. And most people, in my opinion, tend as they age to become way too conservative. Once upon a time, the average person worked till 65 and died at 70, and therefore they had a five-year time horizon. Nowadays, the average 65-year-old is going to live another 20 years, and half of them are going to live longer. And if you've got that 20 to 30 to 35-year time horizon, the 65-year-old with the 55-year-old wife and the money to take care of the second to die, you likely have a 35-year time horizon for that second to die, and you really need to see through that long time horizon to get your money there. Most people underestimate their time horizon. Mm -hmm. So you need an advisor that can help you figure that out and get you on a plan that gets you to that very long-term orientation, which usually involves what uh, mm -hmm. investor thinks of as more risk than they wanted to take. Because what most people want to do is be comfortable and not worry. 
But in reality, comfort's a very dangerous thing if you've got a long, long time ahead of you. Mm. Well, and for young people like me, I mean, we're going to need to save well beyond our hundreds, right? People are living longer. Well, and the other feature, of course, is, and I did a column in USA Today on this uh, just a couple weeks ago, people don't understand Social Security right because it's really not like so many think people always argue this with me and they're always wrong. They always think it's like there's actually money that they've put aside that's invested someplace to then come back to them, that it's theirs. Mm. In fact, it's a governmental pay-as-you-go system. And at some point in time, when it's in Congress's best interest to so do, which is the conflict between millennials and baby boomers, mm. at a point in time as the baby boomers are aging and the millennials are in prime earning power, that we're going to change all the rules about this and in fact, anybody that's relying on Social Security when they're young, forget about it. I mean, old people will be okay because they'll still be the voting power of the, of the baby boomers. But once you get past the baby boomers, this thing's going away and you better have saved for yourself. Mm. So any tips for young people on how to sort of craft a portfolio that can withstand all those years? Well, mind you, people tend to be too myopic. Mm. And the most important thing to remember is that in the long term, when you've got a really long time horizon and you're looking at liquid asset classes and you don't know a lot that other people don't know, which is almost everyone, keep it straight down the middle, simple in stocks, because stocks have a higher long-term return than bonds or cash, because you're adjusting for business becoming innovative mm -hmm. and doing new things and adapting to reality as technology changes. And in that process, in that sweep, you get a higher return with equities in the long term and you don't want to try to be too cute. You don't want to try to be time in the market when you're young. To do all the stuff that a market person would do, mm. you got to go back to the fundamental concept in finance theory, which is very, very basic, that to make a profitable trade, you need to know something other people don't know somehow, some way. That's very hard to do. And for the average young person who's busy working and in family formation stage mm. and doing all the things that's normal and age appropriate for young people to do in their 20s and 30s and what have you, trying to figure out how you know something other people don't know in the market, you, you, all, all you got is a guess about the same things everybody else knows, which is a sucker's game in finance theory and in reality. So you just play it straight down the middle. All right, important information from Ken Fisher. Always great having you. Thank great you. Great to be with you, Scott, always.